Uh, week two, as you can imagine, we had quite a few questions. Uh, they got emailed through us, to us over the course of the last week. Um, but a quick review, we're going to jump in and kind of hit the ground running and do some new stuff here. Um, I asked the question last week, and we started with the question, is Jesus a Democrat, an Independent, or a Republican? And we went to these two passages of Scripture. And the answer to the question is, yes. Um, he is all of those things. Because as followers, we walk into a voting booth, and if we are followers of Christ, we are taking Him into that voting booth, and when we cast a vote, that is the vote. Uh, and so basically, in that moment, we have told Jesus, this is what we are. Now, that makes it sound like we can make Jesus do something He doesn't want to do, and that's not what the intent of that is. But there is a responsibility that we have if He lives in us, and He does, um, then when we go into that voting booth and when we get involved in politics or whatever it is, He's with us. And so we're never alone, and that's important. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when we think about it, uh, and we talked after that, and of course we won't, we're not going to go back down that road again, but uh, we talked about your vote matters a lot more than you think. Um, I gave you what my personal political agenda was. We'll probably get there again tonight. I'll come back and review that. Um, John 8.32 is where, once again, we go. Anybody got that verse off the top of your head? Something about truth. <laughs> Something about truth. Yeah. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then the opposite of that also then is quite possibly true. If you don't know the truth, um, then you will be in bondage. And so the truth becomes very, very important. And we talked about the difficulty that we have today, in our culture especially, uh, of trying to figure out what's true or not, what's real or not. I mean, if you've watched the news cycle, uh, you know, it, it's crazy. This time last week we were talking about the debate that was. But news cycles change so fast. Um, and there's a debate tonight, if you didn't know that. At 9 o'clock there's a debate that comes on tonight. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we've had most of the White House has gotten COVID-19. Uh, the president's been in the hospital. He's out of the hospital. I mean, just it's, it, you think about all the things that happen over the course of a week, and it is insane trying to keep up with this wacky world that we live in. Um, but truth is important. Um, and then we talked about the past <coughs> and history, and I made the distinction for you, and I said the past and history are not the same. And I said that history is written by the person with the sharpest axe. In other words, history is written usually by the winners, especially if you go back to the Middle Ages. What we know of the Middle Ages, we know the history written by the survivors of the Middle Ages. We don't really know about the Middle Ages. We weren't there. Now, time has changed, and we have the opportunity now um, to kind of move forward. And so then we moved into a conversation that has a lot to do with what we're talking about, though, and we're going to pick it up there again. I asked the question last week, how do you kill 11,283,000 people? Um, which, of course, we started talking about the Holocaust. And I completely depressed you by the end of the night. Um, we barely had that conversation uh, over. We were talking about it with the men on Sunday night. Um, I cannot tell you how many pieces of email I've gotten. Um, and, um, and, and, and we'll try to answer all of them at least by the time we get to the end of it. Um, but what I was not saying, and make sure you hear me, and this will become clearer, I think, tonight. I was not saying that America is like Nazi Germany. Okay? I was not making that jump. Somebody said, are you saying, and, and, I, and, they, and they went all political on me. Um, and I laughed. I said, I, I, said I, didn't, I didn't say Democrat, Independent, or Republican after the first five minutes of the, of the class. Um, this is a conversation where the political party doesn't really come into play. But that's the way people are. I mean, as most of you guys know, I mean, I mentioned this uh, before, but I mean, you know, I, when I wrote Kingdom Chaos, I mean, I have a president that is very much like a president that many of you are familiar with. <laughs> but yet, in the book, there's no, I mean, there's things that are said, but there's no political stances taken. I mean, there's no right or left to the book. And yet, everyone who reads the book reads into it what they believe and what they want to hear. And so some reviewers reviewed it in that light which was incredibly weird and funny because I was so careful not to go down a road that I was going to have to dig myself back out of later. Um, because we hear what we want to hear. We hear through the lens that makes us most comfortable. The men dealt with this a little bit the other night because we live in a world that basically has decided that we are God and we get to create what's true. 
But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that is sin. You don't have the luxury of creating truth. Although, we live in a world that loves to do that. Uh, John Barber threw the phrase in the men's group, and we were laughing about it. We batted around the room a little bit. But, you know, the, you've met the people that say, well, that's true for you. That's your truth. But that's not true for me. And at the end of the day, yeah, that's, just, that's, that's, that's just one of the stupidest things people can say. Um, you know, and here, let me, let me be as self-deprecating as I can be. You don't need to give a rip about my personal truth. What you need to care about is the truth that I share about Jesus. And I believe that to be true. What I believe, my opinions, they don't matter that much. Um, Hmm? Uh, they matter to me a lot, um, and they will impact the people I'm around a lot. Um, but, but again, you know, but we live in a world where people say that, and the audacity of people, the lunacy of people to think that's a smart thing to say. And I want you to know, if someone has ever said it to you, they say they're dumber than a turnip. That, uh, you, you just really, I mean, you really are... Uh, convinced that you are God at that point. Um, and we live in a culture that that is a norm. But last week, we painted a very depressing picture of how 11 million <laughs> people die, uh, and it was bad. And so here's what I'm going to promise you. Tonight, Leanne kicked it over to me early. Well, it's going to get a little worse. <laughs> but but, but <laughs> we get another million before we're done. No, and then, then it's going to get better. Uh, then it will get better if you give me time. Um, because this, see, where we, I hated to leave it where we left it last week, but also you, like I, have a kid to get home, and so some of you had to get out of here, and I understand that. Um, but boy, we just kind of left it just hanging out there like, oh my gosh, this is just so bad. These people, you feel so bad for them. But most of you walked out the door just like I did, thinking about that kind of question that we were pondering. And the reality is, you and I both know that didn't just happen overnight. I mean, Nazi Germany just didn't wake up one day and kill 11 million people. So <coughs> it's always good to ask questions. Um, not all questions are good. People say they are. Not all questions are good. Some questions, some questions you ought to keep yourself because you just show the silly side of you. But some questions are really good. <laughs> and some questions, questions need to be answered. And so I think a fair question is, how did things get out of hand? I mean, how did they get to that point? Right? Now, and again, if you're like I am, that's my, I mean, when I read the history, when I look at the stories, that's what, that's what kind of resonates with me. How did they get here? And this is where you have to be willing to go look into the past for truth. Um, because, you know, we have, we have a nation over in the Middle East that basically says, the Holocaust didn't happen. And you can argue all you want, but that's their truth. <laughs> that's not, it's not, it's not really what happened. But you say it long enough, loud enough, people believe it. And so you, we could argue with a wall. But you have to go back and take a look at what really happened um, and decide what went on. So if you're a history buff, you know, uh, you know, you know part of this story. If not, let's, let's, let's make it worse before we can make it better. Um, the National Socialist German Workers' Party was led by Adolf Hitler. Uh, he rose to power during a time of economic uncertainty in a nation full of people in Germany that were longing for better times. However, Germany was a modern industrialized nation with well-informed citizens who enjoyed the luxury of being as high-tech as possible for that era. In other words, they were informed. They were not ignorant. They were not third world lost and cut off from society somewhere with no access to, to information. They actually had um, print and broadcast media, and that was very much a part of their culture. And so for us, that would be like you know, the equivalent of us having our cell phones and having the internet and having cable network news. I mean, that's all you could have. Germany had that. So it's not like Germany was technologically impaired at this point. Um, Hitler was a man uh, of the common people. 
He had been a lance corporal in the army. His speeches were exciting. They were passionate. Um, he promised more and better and new and different. And he um, vowed rapid change and swift action. And according to history, Hitler would adapt what he said for each audience. In an agricultural area, he pledged tax cuts for farmers and new laws to protect food prices. If he was talking to um, working class neighborhoods, he talked about the redistribution of wealth. He attacked the high profits that were being generated by the business owners. When he appeared before financiers or captains of industry, he focused on his plans to destroy communism and tear away the power of the trade unions that they hated. Hitler said this to his inner circle, how fortunate for leaders that men do not think. Make the lie big, make it simple, and keep saying it, and eventually they'll believe it. Remember the answer to the question, how do you kill 11 million people? You lie to them. And we talked about how they set that up and how very much in Nazi Germany there was a multi-tiered plan to lie to people to get them to um, basically go die. Hitler also wrote an autobiography that came out about that time. And in the book, and this is a quote from Adolf Hitler, the great masses of the people will more easily fall victim to a big lie than to a small one. And the book was a bestseller in Germany. And the German people read the book and read what he said. And the masses believed him anyway. I mean, he had told his inner circle that we can get away with telling lies. He wrote about it in his autobiography. And he made the bestseller list. And people still believed him. And if they didn't believe him, they just ignored him which may have been the other side of it. 10% um, of Germany's population of 79.7 .7 million people actively worked or campaigned to bring about Hitler's change. Even at the height of its power in 1945, the Nazi political party boasted only eight and a half million members in an 80 million, uh, country of 80 million. <coughs> so, the remaining 90% of Germans, teachers, doctors, ministers, farmers, did what? They didn't do anything. They stood by and they watched. Uh, mothers and fathers held their voices, covered their eyes, closed their ears. The vast majority of ed the educated population accepted their salaries, which they were still getting. They avoided the uncomfortable truth that was happening all around them and was ling lingering over them like a serpent getting ready to strike. And when the Nazis came for their kids, it was too late. You see, it wasn't just the Jews who were persecuted because today, because history doesn't cover this real well, um, most people are unaware the, the 11 million people exterminated, five million of them were not Jewish. See, it wasn't 11 million Jews that were exterminated. Um, six million Jews were exterminated. Um, and they did something, um, and you may be familiar with this, maybe you've heard about this, they, they would identify you by asking you, mandating that you wear pieces of cloth. And that was the rules. And so if you were Jewish, you would wear a yellow triangle. And that was set apart to make you, let everyone know that you were Jewish. Um, but what a lot of people don't know is that there were other colors that were used as well. Brown triangles identified gypsies and those of Roman descent. Purple triangles were worn by Jehovah's Witnesses, Catholic priests, and Christian leaders who ran afoul of the government. <laughs> Black triangles marked one as a vagrant, worn by any person lacking documentation or the inability to prove a permanent address. Blue triangles were forced on those who had moved to Germany from other countries unless they were Jewish and they got yellow. All the Jews got yellow. Red triangles were worn by a large and diverse group. You wore red if you were a member of a trade, union, a trade union, you were a Democrat, a Freemason, or any other category labeled nonconformist. You got a red triangle. Pink badges identified homosexuals or any other sexual predator. You got to wear pink. 
Green badges were given to common thieves and murderers. And since they were not a threat to anyone politically, they put them in charge of the others. So the murderers and the thieves, called capos, were often put in charge of the other groups to keep them in line because they were not a political threat. Purple badges, red and pink and brown, blue and black, all worn by moms and dads and children who were not the first to be selected to go away to these camps. Um, but once you put one on, and after the yellow ones disappeared. So was that a requirement by law? By law. You had to wear that to be in Germany? It was a mandate. Wow. You will wear this. It was a national mandate. I know some of you just thought of mask. I know. <laughs> I know you did. I know you did. I can see, I can see, I can see eyes in the room go ping, 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 ping. <laughs> People were elbowing each other. Um, in at least one German town, Andy Andrew, uh, and Andrews told this story. In at least one German town, the railroad tracks ran behind the church in that town. The eyewitness stated this, I quote, We heard stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it because we felt what could anyone do to stop it. Each Sunday morning, we would hear the train whistle blowing in the distance, then the wheels coming over the tracks, and we became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed. We realized it was carrying Jews like cattle in their cars. Week after week, the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear the sounds of those wheels because we knew we would hear the cries of the Jews en route to a death camp, and their screams tormented us. We knew the time the train was coming, and when we heard the whistle blow, we began singing hymns. By the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard screams, we sang louder. And soon we heard them no more. Years have passed, and no one talks about it now. But I still hear that train whistle in my sleep. I mean, I can think of nothing more heart-wrenching and heartbreaking than that story of how did you respond when you knew that the Jews were going to die? We just sang hymns louder. And so... We're talking about truth, I told you. It'll start getting better now. Um, the truth is important. Hitler almost took over the world because he wanted the power, the fortune, and the glory, and he lied to get it. And with all we know today, as we come back now and come back to 2020, We are smart enough to know that telling the truth will not solve all of the nation's problems. But it is a beginning. And earlier I told you I have a political agenda. It has nothing to do with parties and it has nothing to do with how you vote. Because in this room I know that we have a, we, we have a cross section of people who lean certain ways to vote, who will vote certain ways. I, some of you and I, some, we have talked about politics and I love talking <laughs> about politics. And some of you, um, you know, just kind of keep it yourself, but you just, you know, you, you, and, and that's okay too. I mean, it, it's, um, you know, and as I told you, this is not about who you vote for, but this is about how you vote and how we exercise our rights as Americans. Because speaking truth, in my opinion, should be the least that we require of our elected leaders. I mean, that's a thinking low bar. I mean, after all, what is your standard for being led? See, we have the right and we ought to expect that our leaders wouldn't lie to us. You see, the danger to America is not a single politician with ill intent, no matter what the news channels will tell you, or even a group of them. The most dangerous thing any nation faces is when the citizens of that nation are capable of trusting a liar to lead them. In the long run, it's a lot easier to undo the policies of crooked leadership than to restore common sense and wisdom to a deceived population willing to elect a leader like that in the first place. Uh, any country can survive having chosen a fool to be their leader. 
But history has shown time and time again that a nation of fools will not survive. And so we go back to what we said earlier. In a few weeks, we will take Jesus into the voting booth with us. And we have a responsibility to make a decision of how we want to be led. And we have the responsibility to make sure that we have expectations and standards and that we use that vote wisely because that vote matters. Remember, we talked all about that last week. Incredibly, there are currently 545 human beings who are directly, legally, morally, and individually responsible for most of the problems America faces. Have you ever wondered why America doesn't have a balanced budget? You ever heard a politician say they weren't for a balanced budget? Have you ever heard a politician speak in favor of a complicated tax code that ordinary citizens can't understand? then why do we have a complicated tax code that citizens don't understand? Here's the answer. Meet the 545 men and women who enact every law, propose every budget, and set every policy enforced on the United States of America. They are one president, nine Supreme Court justices, today that's eight, by the way, 100 senators and 435 members of the House of Representatives. And by the way, just so you know, make note of this, if you lie to one of them, it is a felony. If they lie to you, it's considered politics. According to the United States Bureau of Census, our population is now 328 million people. So that's 545 of them and 328 million of us. And so, it is the 328 million of us that give the power to that 545. Did you know that during the past quarter century, no presidential election has been won, more, been won by more than 10 million ballots cast? I mean, lately they've been a lot closer than that. Yet every federal election during the same time period had at least 100 million people of voting age that did not vote. So of our 300 million people, 100 million are setting it out. They could. And so, when you look at the wacky, wonky, crazy political world that just seems to be bubbling all around us, at the end of the day, we have to understand that we have a responsibility. And again, as followers, we take our faith into a voting booth. We take our faith into this, the body politic. We take our faith, and remember, you'll remember my political agenda said, we, I want our politics to fall into the Lordship of Christ. We <coughs> flesh out our politics based on our walk with Christ. And we have some expectations. Now, Knowing that the quality of one's life can be determined by the quality of questions, let's ask some good questions again, right? Um, for example, it is bothersome to me that some of the world's greatest civilizations average about 200 years of greatness. It doesn't mean the country ceased to exist, but it means the glory days run about 200 years. We are now over that. Um, civilizations seem to follow the same identifiable, repeatable sequence from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to courage, from courage to liberty, liberty to abundance, abundance to complacency, complacency to apathy, apathy to dependence, and finally from dependence back into bondage. That's the pattern of history. You can pick, you, and pick whatever civilization and look at the glory days, look at the rise, look at the ebb, and look at the fall. Just a question. Why do they only last a couple hundred years? What happens? And then, ask yourself the question, you know, where would we as a nation be on that curve? Where do we fall as a citizen, citizenry? Is that a word? Is that a word? Citizenry. 
That says, yeah, that's what I'm looking for and I can't say it. All right. Is lying okay? Uh, is lying to get elected acceptable? Even if the candidate's intention is to do good stuff. Um, have you ever noticed how we judge the bad guys by their actions and the good guys by their intentions? <laughs> but remember the principle, right? Direction, not intention, gets you to your destination. But to be honest with you, Sometimes when I watch, I don't know who the good guys and the bad guys are anymore. <laughs> I can't keep up. It's not like a good old John Wayne movie. They were easy to identify. Well, not so easy anymore. Um, and so I come back again to what I said. Would truth be a starting point for telling the difference? I mean, wouldn't that be a novel idea? Someone's going to tell us the truth. What course are we on as a country? Um, do we believe that you can determine a destination by examining the direction that we're going? Uh, and if so, where are we headed? Um, hopefully, when you look, you don't hear the whistle and the wheels as the train comes down the track. And hopefully we're not guilty of singing loud. But I told you, I, I have an agenda, and here it is again. I told you I'd mention it again. Um, my political agenda is this. Uh, I believe that a country that no longer believes in its founding ideas cannot prosper and survive. So I want an America uh, that has current and future leaders that will embrace and live up to our Judeo-Christian princi core principles as written by the founding fathers and put forth in the Constitution. I also want the public to hold these leaders accountable for doing so. <coughs> and say, you know what, if you don't, it's not all right. What a novel idea. I pray that the people who follow God will bring their politics under the Lordship of Jesus. That's my agenda. Not overly complicated. Simple, actually. Um, and so the first part of that is, though, that we need to embrace our Judeo-Christian Judeo foundations. Now, I know that you've heard the phrase, we live in a cancel culture right now where we are trying desperately to cancel out pieces of our past that we don't like because we don't want them to be part of our history. But, to be very honest with you, it's a part of our journey. Uh, America is not perfect. Oh, no, no, no. And we have a long way to go, but we are the best thing going. And I am you know, red, white, and blue up and down my spine. I can, I, and I, I don't think it's an accident that everyone wants to come here. But the cancel culture also would like to erase our foundations because if you can erase the foundations, then you can change the trajectory of what's going on. Whether you believe it or not, whether historians will tell you this or not, whether you have heard somebody want to debate this, I'm telling you, and I'm going to tell you where I got it, the Founding Fathers considered the Bible as a source and the foundation and framing of our country. Um, in September of 1796, George Washington talked about how virtue and morality could not exist without the influence of God. In his farewell address to the nation, he said this, and I quote, Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of a particular structure, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of a religious principle. He added, to the distinguished character, character of patriot, it should be our highest glory to add one more distinguished character of Christian. George Washington knowing that the future and the foundation of the country is set up on godly principles, and our survival depends on that. John Adams, in a letter to Thomas Jefferson in June of 1813, wrote this, The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the only principles in which that, beautifully, that beautiful assembly of young gentlemen could unite over. And what were these general principles? I answer, 
the general principles of Christianity in which all of these groups were united. The foundation of America, the decision to begin and declare independence, came about as a group of men got together believing that God gave to each person a set of inalienable rights and those rights were a gift from the Creator. John Adams also wrote in his diary that when you, when you build a nation on a system of laws based on God's Word, it would eventually lead to a virtuous utopia, a paradise here on earth, if you can get it right. Um, go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 28. Matthew 7, 24 through 28. And somebody read that for us if you wouldn't mind. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. We come back to that basic moment of understanding what our foundation is, and Although we don't hear about it as much as we might want to, maybe we don't recognize it as often as we should, but we're here in this nation as a result of what was, in essence, a quest for religious freedom, religious liberty. And so on those foundations, Judeo-Christian principles, we put together what is this government that we have cobbled together as this great American experiment. Um, up until the American Revolution, religious liberty was not something that people had. Um, but our founding fathers understood that lasting liberty um, could only be established when the people of the country recognized that men were, men were equal and they were endowed by the Almighty with those rights that couldn't be taken away. And so, in our very foundation, um, we are given an opportunity um, to flesh out our faith, but it also means we have to take responsibility. And I think, you know, I, I guess the question is, let's go back to our, our, our starting question. If Jesus goes into the voting booth with you. What or who would he vote for? Because I don't know if you think about it that way, but when you walk into the voting booth, I mean, that's what it is. When you walk into up to the little stand and you vote and you get ready to bubble your things or you fill out your, your absentee ballot or however you vote, I mean, that in essence is what you're doing. And so let me, I mean, let me just give you some big, big ideas. Okay, big broad concepts of some stuff to think about um, that, that, that I value as a follower. I'm not saying you have to. I'm just saying think about how your faith fits into it, okay? I want to elect politicians who refuse to pass ordinances and laws that force me to compromise my faith. So when politicians talk, that's what I listen for. Are they going to get behind something or push something through that's going to make me compromise my faith? And what does that look like? Um, I want to elect godly men and women that will pass laws to protect our religious liberties. Uh, our freedom uh, to call sin, sin. Our freedom to worship our freedom to invite neighbors to come with us to worship. I want to have that kind of religious freedom. I don't need a politician 
who holds office to be my spiritual leader. What I need is them to stay out of the way so I can flesh out my faith. And so I look for that when I look for those I'm going to vote for. Um, we're hearing a lot about the Supreme Court these days. You know, um, and you know, that was a big part of our last election cycles. And so one of the things that I will listen for in the hearings, as much as I listen to them next week, um, like I think they start next week, we'll be hearing whether or not this potential Supreme Court judge um, will uphold and honor the godly heritage and the basic foundations of our country. That's what I'm listening for. But I'm also listening to the people that are going to ask the questions. Because we live in a world where the hearings become showtime. And so they put on display who they are. And so to me, more importantly than the vetting of the judge, is what's said from the deists that's up there, or Zoom call or whatever they're going to do. Um, but I think, I, you know, I, I'm in favor of judges that are going to uphold constitutional rights. Um, uh, and I want them to stay away from our religious liberties. I think that's a big deal. Um, and I want to let people who are morally upright, who are willing to talk about Jesus and speak and act and follow him, but that one's tough. That one's tough. Because that gets a little muddy. And so you have to break that down then. And you start thinking about it this way. And I'm going to end with a quote here in a minute that Leanne actually found for me. Um, and I'm going to end in a second with that. But um, which candidate are you going to vote for that's going to protect your right to express, express your religious beliefs in the public square like you want to? So when you're casting a vote for someone, are they going to give you the freedom to exercise your religious beliefs in the public square? Which candidate is going to protect your right to express your religious beliefs in your business? And should you have rights to do that? Yeah, you should. Which candidate will appoint judges who understand the importance of religious liberty? and we build on the foundation that our, our family fathers put together? Um, will your candidate stand up to the ungodly movements that come along that try to build our, build our country on a plywood foundation <laughs> instead of something that is strong? Because we tend to live in an era where everyone wants to be led by a group. You know, when I turn on the news sometimes, I hear this group has this person's ear, this group has this person ear, they're pulling this person left, they're pulling this person right, they're pulling this person center. And you hear a lot of terms that are out there just thrown around. So when you're making the vote, I mean, so when you're casting your vote, um, you're voting in such a way that allows Jesus to shine in our culture. So, is he Democrat? Yeah. Independent? Yeah. Is he Republican? Yeah. So let me give you this quote, and then we'll be out the door, and then we'll pick up again next week. And next week we'll talk about... <laughs> next week we'll talk about issues. Um, we all got issues, right? Uh, so we're going to talk about issues next week, but, but, but kind of pull them under a, a Jesus umbrella, right? Of, of, okay. We know what the noise is. What is the big Jesus umbrella that it fits under? But here's, here's your quote for the week as you go. Your vote is not a valentine. You're not confessing your love for a candidate when you vote for them. Instead, you're making a chess move for the world that you want to live in, that you want your children to live in, and you want your grandchildren to live in. We are facing an election season where we actually have people who are saying, I'm voting against someone because I just don't like them. Well, shame on you. 
bow up, be a follower, and vote godly ways. And I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm just saying vote your convictions. It's not a love letter you're sending to the politician. You know what? I've never voted for anybody that loved me back. <laughs> but it is a move that you make in the bigger picture of how you're going to navigate. So think of it that way. You're playing chess. You're trying to move the pawns, the senators, <laughs> the congressmen, the president, across the board where you need them to be so that you can be the best follower you can be. So, so see, it didn't end as bad, right? I mean, it's, I, I, it, maybe it'll get cheerier. It'll get cheerier as we go by. Uh, but we won't talk about killing 11 million people anymore. All right, um, questions before we pray, and then we got to get out. Sure. A vote is not a valentine. You're not confessing your love for a candidate. Instead, it is a chess move for the world that you want to live in, you want your children to live in, and your grandchildren to live in. And I tell you, the older I get, the last part of that matters even more. And now I'm thinking long term for my children and my grandchildren. Let's pray. God, <coughs> you, you care about how we vote. <laughs> and I think you care more about how we vote than who we vote for. And so that really is a lesson we have to learn. Who do we want to be led by? What kind of leader do we want to give that authority to? Because as we follow you, we know that you're our king. But at the same time, you are very clear about drawing those lines about how we relate to government and the culture around us. So let us be agents of change. Let us be people of hope. And help us to be people who are willing to step up and step in and make a difference. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.